This is the, uh, the other side of the bookend, or the, the second bookend, I guess you'd say. We started the uh, convening earlier this week with a conversation about uh, where, where is all of this going? And those of you who are with us on stage, who are on stage for that, remember that we started to draw a map. And the map that we've been drawing relates to trying to get to a mountaintop. And the mountaintop is the good, account, the good economy, uh, a sustainable, resilient, equitable future for us all. Um, I'm lucky to have with me, again, a, a tremendously interesting group of people, all of them colleagues, who are going to help me talk about what the week has sort of told us about where our work is going, but also really to give them a chance to elucidate the work that they're already doing. And so I'll be trying to give a little bit of a, of a contextual framing to that. As you can see, I have five really smart, really interesting people on stage with me, and I have one hour to uh, make sure that we all get across what we want to, but also give you a chance to ask this really interesting group of people some questions. So I'm going to use every trick in my handbag to um, try to keep us going, and uh, I really appreciate your help in, in, in having me be able to do that. Um, so just to give us a couple of framing elements before, before I have my uh, compadres here introduce themselves, when we finished the conversation at the beginning of SOCAP, there were a couple of things that came out, and they're on the map, and we'll show you the map when we finish today's discussion. We've actually redrawn it, and it's, it's looking pretty great. Um, one of the things that came out was that the word impatience wasn't really working so much for the group that was on stage, and they wanted to replace the word impatience, which was the sort of counterbalance to patience, patient capital, patient um, uh, ability, the ability to be patient about returns. They didn't like the word impatience. They preferred to think of the sense of urgency. So we sort of think about urgency versus impatience. Um, a couple of our panel members at the beginning of SOCAP also called out to the audience and said, who out there is under 20 years old? You remember Darren doing that, which gave us a chance to think for a minute about the really important um, question of multi-generational and intergenerational disciplines in order to reach that mountaintop. Uh, we talked about SOCAP providing a marketplace in the context of an ecosystem that's not fully developed, and I'm hopeful maybe we'll come back to that a little bit in, uh, when we talk today. Um, and we also started to touch on the fact that um, it's really not that we're talking about a model, we're talking about multiple models for how you get to the mountaintop. And, and the question came up several times, to me anyway, of whether or not part of what we need to work on is conversing more articulately about which model each of us are deploying, you know, which structural elements, which vehicles we're using, so that we start to do a better job of educating one another about each model we're using. And I know Vinit and others and I have talked about that uh, during the week. So that's, that's me laying a little context. Um, I'm going to ask each of my panelists to introduce themselves. I'm not going to go through these um, biographies with you because you've got them. You know many of these people. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, uh, starting with you, Vinit. Um, tell the audience who you are, um, what your organization is, and something, something fun or interesting about yourself. Yeah, my name is Vinit Rai. Uh, manage a fund called Avishka. Founded a company called Intellicap. Uh, fun. That's a difficult part of it. I've been busy working, so fun has not been part of it. But I love to drive. Great. <laughs> Please. Hi, I'm Catherine Collins. I'm the founder of Honeybee Capital, which focuses on research relevant to sustainability in all of its forms, and increasingly focuses on biomimicry and natural principles as a framework for truly sustainable and even regenerative investing. And after many years of leading Honeybee Capital but not actually being a beekeeper, which is a little fraudulent, I finally started actually <laughs> keeping bees this past summer. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Go bees. Like That's bees. fantastic. Yeah. I like bees, too. Tim. Uh, Tim Freundlich. I'm the founder and uh, head up Impact Assets and also sit on the president of um, uh, Mission Hub uh, and, and on the Global Hub Board. 
used to be at Calvert Foundation for a long time, 12 years. And what's cool about me? What's neat about me? What's something fun. Something, something, something fun. fun. Last I night. juggle. I grew up in a hippie urban commune. That's where I probably met Wayne, actually. <laughs> <laughs> where and I, and I'm not proud about it. And I actually don't share that. Don't go into your often. lineage. But since this is such an intimate crew, like, you know, naked sweat lodges, that sort of thing. <laughs> I was little. It wasn't my choice. It was done to me. I love it. Now you have to top that. And we just found out we're co-hub members in San Francisco, and we didn't even know it. He well, hangs out on the bottom floor. I'm a floor one kind of yeah. cafe rat, and you're an up, grown up upstairs. Um, my name is Natalie Foster. I'm the executive director of Peers, P-E-E-R-S. Uh, we launched five weeks ago to support the sharing and peer economy. Um, I've spent the last well over a decade in the intersection of politics and technology. Started an organization called Rebuild the Dream with Van Jones uh, to fix the U.S. economy and quickly realized that the inspiration I was seeing was in people turning to one another to build their own economy. So um, just getting peers off the ground. And I'd say my fun fact right now is that I'm a new mom of a 10 and a half month old who is not sleeping. <laughs> not sleeping. Not sleeping at all. Fun part. He's going to your urban commune. Okay. <laughs> and I'm uh, Wayne Selby with um, Calvert Funds, Calvert uh, Foundation, Impact Assets. I have a company in Beijing doing corporate social responsibilities in Tao. What's cool about me is I'm working with my daughter in a Chia company. And if you see her, tell her she has beautiful eyes because she has her father's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. The, um, all right, so um, we're, we all have to think about this visual representation of a mountaintop. And what I'm going to ask each of you to do, and I'll pick you in kind of random order, is to tell me what concretely you're going to be working on in the next three to five years to help us get to that mountaintop. This is in the context, though, of us not being yet past a critical tipping point. So we're going to sort of draw out some systemic things that you all think need to happen around you in order to get past that tipping point and eventually to the mountaintop. But just to keep us sort of uh, in this sort of lively, engaged conversation, I would like each of you first to tell me, OK, picture this mountaintop. Picture yourself going to that mountaintop. And as you describe the work you're going to do for the next three to five years, describe to me what the path looks like. I mean, quite literally. Is it like a rocky, stony path that you see as you're about to start talking? Is it a meandering kind of, uh, are you tacking like a sailboat? Um, or are you just going to like march straight up the mountain? So before you tell me what you're working on, describe to me what came to mind when I said, you, you got to get to that mountaintop in terms of what that path looks like. So um, let's see, Catherine, I'm going to. Make you sure. be our first victim here. Okay. Uh, well, it's a, it's a good image, and uh, I'm glad that the notion of multiple paths is embedded in it, uh, because I think we sometimes skip that part. Um, I would say my first few years being engaged in, in this community, broadly defined, felt very uphill, very much like right, steeply climbing, grabbing by your fingernails kind of uphill. And I'm not sure if I have switched paths or just gain tremendous energy, but at this point, I, I see so many paths from here up that mountain, and they all look just delightful and, and doable, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be at that point. So it sounds like you're charging up the path, but you've got a lot more energy. A lot more energy and a lot Tailwind. more options, I think, which And are what specifically healthy. are you going to work on uh, at Honeybee for the next three years? What's, what's the project, the orientation that we all need to have towards what you're going to be working on? Sure. So my work at Honeybee, I, I often describe as translating uh, between different communities. I, I spent 20 years in a very traditional investment setting, and so a lot of my time is sort of carrying wisdom back and forth between these communities. But in this context of the map, I, I think really uh, my focus now on biomimicry investing is almost a, a map maker, not in the sense of charting, but in being able to help people identify what is it that makes for a good path? What are the characteristics that really embody an approach or a system that is sustainable and regenerative and optimized and all the things that we're looking for? Do you mind just giving us a brief definition of biomimicry? Sure. Many people have listened to panelists, I know, but would yeah, you just do so, that for us? So biomimicry, the, the word has taken on a lot of buzz, and unfortunately with that is coming some confusion. It does not mean 
just imitating nature. Uh, the essence of biomimicry is to pause before designing any endeavor or product or adventure, uh, to pause and ask yourself, what would nature do here in this context? How would nature perform the function that I'm trying to perform? So it's a really fundamental reorientation of the starting point of, of designing plans. And uh, I find that it, it points to a system that is automatically all of those things we're looking for. It's long-term in duration, it's multi-dimensional, it's focused on optimizing instead of maximizing, uh, and it's also rooted in such deep and comfortable and strong wisdom. It is the most ancient wisdom we have as our, at our disposal, and so I find it's a really rich starting point. Thank you very much. Vineet, I'm gonna have you go next. Um, so picture that, that that image of you getting to the mountaintop, this ultimate visionary goal that I know you have, what does the path literally look like um, when you sort of see it in your mind's eye? You have somebody. What cars? <laughs> <laughs> there is a blue and white Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> You want to know what's next? <laughs> the tow truck. <laughs> and uh, no, there's the a blue Volvo and a Bayshore. white Volkswagen that are about to be towed. What kind of Volkswagen? Uh, it says <laughs> a white Volkswagen that's about to be towed. Is that, are, are any of you likely to have to run off stage? Okay. okay. <laughs> For those of you with either of these vehicles, run out now. Um, and the back side of this says, um, There'll be a sale on cosmetics in aisle four. At, <laughs> no, okay. All right, uh, uh, back to where we were. Vinny, what is that? What literally? What does that path look like? You know, I actually tried to. I closed my eyes and tried to visualize what you were saying. So uh, the first reaction that came to me is uh, uh, there are far too many paths to go up, and I am not sure if the path that I am following is the right path. So maybe mm. there's 20 paths going up. And since I don't know which path that I, the path that I'm following is the right way, uh, I have to have 20 vineyards climbing up simultaneously. So the first thing I've thought about is replicating myself, finding more of people to, who are going to climb from every side uh, to reach up. But we are all going to climb up in one direction. So no meandering, nothing. We just go straight. Assuming these are different paths and one of us will succeed, maybe it's possible all of us will succeed. So that's what was my first Beautiful reaction. Image. Mm -hmm. Beautiful image. What specifically are you working on over the next three years? Um, you can pick any part if you've got many things going, I know. Yeah. But. So I'll quickly try to connect everything <laughs> to this. Uh, I'm working on incubation. I chair the board of Willgrow, which is the incubator we set up in 2000. Uh, I chair the board of IntelliCap and IntelliGrow. IntelliCap is a consulting advisory capacity building young people. This is actually the way I, I'm trying to replicate myself and having different leadership. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have actually launched a venture debt company in India, which actually is a huge gap. There is nothing called venture debt in India. So to provide uh, post-venture capital debt. Then I run funds. We have four funds. We have just launched our fifth fund. Uh, each one of them, we are doing different things. First, we have been, we spent the last 13 years focused on India, uh, partly to create depth, partly to create a demonstration of a model partly to create intensity. So my whole idea was that if we can create 300 enterprises that are operating in so-called base of the pyramid in one way or the other, uh, there may be enough evidence that impact investing does create change. Because anecdotal references we have been giving for decades, I don't think so that really works. Uh, when the tire hits the road, you need to be able to actually substantially create an evidence that makes a change. And so my most important thing is if you can create a fairly significant amount of, uh, so I've invested in 40 companies till now, not enough that I thought will be. But I think we have a reasonable amount of understanding of what we have achieved in India. And the second part is to actually move into Africa and Southeast Asia. So we have a fund that we have launched for Southeast Asia. We have taken Sankal to Africa, and hopefully along with it, over the next three years, we will launch funds which are both Asia-focused as well as Africa focused. And again, I understand Asia and Africa are continents. Uh, the policies and approach that we use are actually very, very contextual and specific. So I think we are going to have very different kinds of challenges than what we have faced in India. And that's why it's important to actually have very different kinds of people yeah. leading. Yeah. So me going there and doing it is not the brightest idea. 
So one of the things that you brought out, which I think we all really appreciate, is this need for more talent, more, more replication of, of the right kind of leaders for what needs to get done in the next uh, several years. Um, um, I think I'm going to let Tim go next. So what's the, what's the picture of that path look like in your head? It's like, I'm like spinning around and there's little warm pools that I stop in like every... Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's not that linear for me. I mean, I'm just going to speak sort of personally, but... <laughs> Some the organization for you. <laughs> but we're definitely going up the hill, and I, and I, think, um, and I think there are these moments of just settled uh, celebration, mm commonality, there's the warm pool image, yeah, um, where we image, come yeah. together, and I don't mean SOCAP once a year, although that can okay. work that way. Um, and what it all is, I mean, what I'm working on is, uh, I was trying to figure out how to say it, it's like, it's not middleware, it's, it's like thrilling action, uh, thrilling action infrastructure. Yep. Like words that don't really go together, I think, in most people's minds, um, but that's actually the common thread across the stuff that I care about a lot and engage. It's certainly what Impact Assets aspires to be right. um, in the innovation. And actually, I'm going to a little bit after this, so I'm not going to dwell on that um, in the final right. plenary right. on that, um, to, to really crack the code on how to rewire sort of these this platforms and infrastructures that across a, across a spectrum. I mean, I think of SOCAP like this, uh, and the, the ease of the flow of capital, uh, the hub is, is totally action, right. thrilling action infrastructure going mm. ubiquitous, like everywhere, you know, in every city within a few years, hundreds of thousands of members, and we're already there. I mean, that's right. where we're going. We're going to get there. Right. It's not going to be pretty. Right. You know, it's going to be like, I mean, circuitous and fail forward and all that kind of right. stuff. But what it all has in common is, is a, like, this does not have to be clinical. Right. And we really do have to invest together in plumbing right. across a whole spectrum of modalities of consumption, investment, philanthropy, whatever, you know, right. of that stuff, totally, yep. <laughs> um, vocation, right. and celebration, and sharing of, 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 of best practice and, and, and intelligence, and, and that's, that's, that's what I'm going to be doing for probably the next 20 years. Tim and I work very closely together, and one of the things we, I love about Tim, and I hope he loves about me, is that we often use different images, but we're always talking about sort of the same thing. And um, I really like the, uh, the picture of stopping at the, like at the pool, you know, and like taking your clothes off and jumping in for a while. And, I didn't and, say anything about taking your oh, clothes true. off. Oh, that's true. Wayne, you were the one we were yeah. talking about. You guys, that's your thing. <laughs> you weren't like there when we were talking about that. Body suit on, like a wetsuit <laughs> and a Mai Tai. <laughs> um, Wayne, how about you? What's the visual that comes to mind to you about this path, pool? Well, one visual when I close my mind about the mountaintop is uh, just a few months ago, in fact, I was in the Tibetan Plateau in Qinghai Province. In fact, I don't know how many of you saw the solar cooker that was here, but Calvert, uh, we led an investment yeah. uh, into that, uh, which is primarily for the, um, the Tibetans uh, gathering dung and others on the plateau. But what I'm talking about there is really our work in China. And I feel like 1.6 billion people, they're arriving on the planet, consuming all these, and that those of us who have been a part of this community, we need to make some efforts to reach and extend some things we've learned, create conversations. Because I can tell you, if the Chinese don't get it, it doesn't matter what you guys do. I, that's, that, that's how the numbers go on the planet. Right. And I feel that to the extent you take opportunities too and can share in international conferences in Asia and so on. And I was there with Kevin in Singapore just a month or two ago on the same mission and bringing SOCAP to Singapore and these kinds of values. So I would say um, that. Secondly, I also want to say in terms of a vision is the democratization of this movement. A lot of us uh, think that impact investing and social capital is about helping these poor people, helping this environment. 
But I also feel there's a spiritual component, which is about allowing people to participate in building this world, about expressing themselves through their money. And this doesn't have to be about high net worth offices or foundations. It can also be about school teachers and others who have a thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollars they want to uh, put in. And we've been doing this through Calvert Foundation, and we have abilities to really expand that and create more partnerships. The demand is strong. In fact, just a few hours ago, I was with a woman from AARP. In fact, we have the URL uh, Impact IRA, right. meaning, well, what about your IRA money? I mean, we have Impact Assets, Donor Advised Fund, but the amount of money in IRAs uh, are, are enormous, and there could be ways that we could facilitate people tapping that kind of money to really provide another source for those of you who are the mavens about how to best deploy it and make the sustainability models and so on. So we're really about, in terms of our value proposition, working on how do we tap the, uh, the, you know, the middle America to make this, right. great, this greatness part of American culture and to bring the excitement and the sharing and the conversations, bring it into people's rooms and say, see, you can be part of that, you can be part of that there. So that's uh, uh, what we're working on. And I'll do one last, sure. only because I was on a panel last year and we got this idea, well, maybe we ought to get the uh, Chinese to fund a bunch of stuff for uh, this EB-5 visas, where if you create 10 jobs, and spend a million dollars, you get a green card. Well, actually, a bunch of people afterwards <laughs> said, Wayne, you ought to really work on that. So I've been in the office. Uh, I've been speaking to Congressman Goodlatte, yeah. who is chairman of the Immigration Committee and chairman of the uh, Judiciary, who runs immigration. Um, it's a mess, immigration. But the point is, you have millions of people around the world who would love to get a green card. That's billions and billions and billions of dollars that could go into our kind of work creating jobs. Right. And so we've been exploring that and creating some conversations and going to I, uh, a conference. At one conference, he actually called me up and asked me to speak about four or five minutes on this proposal, which it's stuck with all the other immigration issues. But the point is that there are ways in policy and others that we can support, as Tim said, the infrastructure and the ways that we can pull certain levers so that those of you who are, you know, putting these opportunities together and really on the front line know that, you know, some of the rest of us are also trying to take care of the plumbing to best support you going forward, and that's our commitment. That's great. That's Bravo. <laughs> You have, you, we're saving you for last, so um, right. what's, a, what's a visual image, um, if you can stick with my analogy? Yeah. You know, what's the path look like to you? Uh, well, I think all over the globe, there's people who are sharing their homes, their cars, their assets, they're collaborating in new ways, they're lending in new ways, they aren't you know, waiting on banks to offer them a loan, they're, they're funding the sorts of projects they want to see. Um, and that that's a movement. And uh, it's, it's with emerging business models that are operating at a scale we've really never seen before. You even have folks who are sharing their home for the first time on something like Airbnb and then are discovering time banks uh, or a whole new sort of way of thinking about the economy. So my visual is a big flashlight. Oh, yeah. that we're shining Great. on the mountain, we're like, wow, this is actually already happening in ways we can't quantify, right? Forbes is saying $3.5 billion will move through the sharing economy this year. Now, that's different than in the old way. It's not going to a centralized corporation. It's, it's going through a platform to the pockets of the people who are on the platform, who are the entrepreneurs sharing their homes, cars. But it's also much bigger than that, right? Because that's just what we can quantify with money. And this is a the very beginning of an industry where there's very little research that's actually been done. So I'm thinking it's a flashlight showing more activity than we have, could possibly. Just don't imagined. shine the flashlight on the pool where... Um, the I'm, naked people yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually... So there's probably a business model in that. I bet there is. <laughs> is there a specific um, uh, initiative or project that you're working... I know you're working on yeah. a lot related to what you just described, but is there something you'd like to highlight that you're going to be working on for the next three years that... Say a little more to us about Yeah. Well, our mission's really threefold at Peers, and that's to um, grow the sharing economy. So how do we um, bring people together who are participating at various points and have them like encourage their collaboration on a local um, level in a way that grows you know, this economy more broadly? But two is mainstream it. Um, 
for as inevitable as these models may seem, my mom in Kansas still thinks it's weird that I would rent out right. my home or share my home or that I would hop in a car with a stranger I just hailed off my mobile phone. Um, so right. there's, there's a really important storytelling aspect there. <laughs> and then the third is to protect it. So um, all over in cities across the world, um, we're figuring out how do we um, regulate these sorts of new activities. Um, and that's going to play out you know, in cities across the world. And we want to help inject people's voices, the people who use these um, new, new ways of operating into the conversation about how we um, how we regulate it. So I heard some, I heard some very interesting um, points here, and just to throw out some, call out the words that sort of s signal what we've been talking about, democratization, replication, replication and leadership, um, infrastructure, uh, dynamics. Um, if any of you want to throw a few words at us, now's the time to do it, but you got to do it in one word. But if you want to shout them out, and, and you heard them, Shout them out now. Anybody got some? Say it again. Thrilling. Thrilling. Storytelling. Storytelling. Collaboration. Collaboration. Replicate. Leverage. Leveraging. Leverage. Leverage, Leverage. <laughs> Leverage then replicate. <laughs> Leverage then replicate. <laughs> Any more? A couple more? Right. Yeah. Say it again, or somebody say it to me. Right. Got it. Okay. All right. So. Prudent woman rule. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. So wise panel. Um, the uh, remember that the discussion at the beginning of SoCap was about the fact that we're not yet at a tipping point. We may not all entirely agree about that framing or that hypothesis, but bear with me at least for today's conversation. We need to get to a, a major tipping point. Obviously, a lot of, a lot of these um, milestones are, are going to be what gets us there. More democratization, more replication, more infrastructure, more thrilling infrastructure, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in that context, I'm going to ask you to tell me um, what systemic change or a specific milestone that you'll cross yourself Either one, a systemic change that you think we all need to pay attention to, or a milestone that you'll cross, where you'll know you've gotten significantly closer to the tipping point. I, I can take either one to sort of continue to round out this conversation. And just give me like the high sign if you want to take a stab at answering this. I'm not going to call on you. If you get your little, let me know that you're, go, go ahead, Vineet. Uh. So personal milestone to either have 300 investments or a billion dollar that has been channeled into the space. That's basically my personal milestone. On the systemic side, I think change in attitude uh, for those who want to participate in this space. Uh, to understand that uh, it's actually as much as you're learning, as much as you want to give. And uh, I think that systemic change might actually be, make that billion dollar possible for me as well. So. Oh. Possibly the systemic change is more important than the billion dollar that I think is a milestone for myself. Uh, we uh, sometimes throw these, uh, well, we've been throwing these monthly um, uh, events in Washington around different issues policy-wise and so on, and our next one is on uh, crowdfunding. And the reason I talk about crowdfunding as a tipping point is because, you know, sometimes life is all about dealing with fear. The fear of what will happen if this and then, so we do the regulation on, and in particular sharing economy. What? You mean like people aren't as evil as the politicians say that we need to keep them in place and they can actually come to your homes and it all works? I mean, I feel that this, um, this, this ability for people to come together over the internet and this kind of crowdfunding could be a tipping point where people go, you know, the world isn't that unfriendly. I don't have to, you know, right. there are possibilities here. I can participate in ways. So I'm, right. I'm kind of looking forward to that yeah. manifestation, mm -hmm. which you've been part of. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think the tipping point comes when it's, you know, it's a millennial sensibility that we could live um, in co-housing and we could not own an automobile but share access to an automobile and we could kind of crowdfund together the kinds of neighborhoods that we want to see. Um, and I think the tipping point comes when that's, you know, much more widely adopted. I, I live in a little town called Sausalito and there's a place called Galilee Harbor. Do, do any of you know Galilee Harbor? 
by any chance? Okay, so you, if you know Galilee Harbor, you know that it is the archetype of, of, a, of a very um, um, long-standing sharing community, sharing economy. So if, for example, you have extra beats, I can just walk down and put them on a table uh, at uh, Galilee Harbor and somebody will cook the beats for somebody who needs them more than I do. So fortunately for me, I get to walk right by that every day. It's pretty nice for me. Um, the, uh, I would just add, I mean, getting to this question of fear, one really powerful way for that transition to happen is when you go from the stage, which is endemic in any early movement of saying, not that, and, and yep. sort of a rejection combative stage to saying, but this, and, and to be able to show something that is so obviously better in every way, it makes it so easy then for people to embrace it with, with yep. courage and excitement and, and much less of that fear. And I. I see that we're right, we're right. That's about a tipping there. point too. Yeah, right. fear came up a lot in the in the in the first plenary, the one that sort of was your bookend plenary, and so it's really interesting to hear it come back in terms of something we need to address to get to the tipping point. Are you afraid of your bees? No. Yeah. No. I was just. I mean, it came to mind as an immediate question. Well, I think. Because Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, if you're allergic, you could die. So let's yeah. not be stupid. But um, but if you're not allergic, uh, and you have a little bit of patience and curiosity, they're mesmerizing. Yeah. Yeah. Tim. Like angel investing. That's right. It's just like angel. <laughs> you might get stung, but it'll be really fun. <laughs> Uh, That's a great analogy. I would just say uh, two things on it. One, I mean, one, in, just to pick up that thread, I, and one of the things I love about, about Impact Hub and this idea of these physical uh, aligned communities, that I, I think that this, this tipping point trust, like it's okay flashlight thing, I think one of the things we've, we've kind of lost, especially in major urban areas in the United States, yeah. which I'll speak from my own first person experience, is you know, it, we, we don't have that persistent physical, trust-based, aligned, right. defined community thing going on as much anymore right. as maybe you know, 50 years ago right. or something. And I, I, I think that it speeds. It's like this impersonal thing, uh, you know, even if you're a millennial, which I'm not, um, the, it, it, it's a lot easier to pick up and reinforce when there's, it, it's part of the, like, where you are right. mm -hmm. is right. present and present. So I think they go together. I think when we, we can rediscover and bolster this amazing renaissance, you know, sort of, of, of the, the online and the, the transactions and the stranger that's not so strange with, with um, a, a recommitment to physical community. And the only other thing I, I was gonna say is, I mean, in terms of venture, I'm really committed to, um, whether it's with Impact Assets or Good Cap or, or just in general, that, and we talked about this on an earlier panel this morning, I, I think we really have to deeply examine what it means to create stakeholder yeah. communities around entrepreneurs yeah. with investors and employees and customers and clients right. and all of that uh, uh, with no baloney. I mean, it's like, because we're in here trying to use conventional toolkits with what, uh, that have time horizons that have nothing to do right. with the kind of mountaintop paths that we're walking along, unless you're in some sort of social media tech startup, something. Right. I mean, we need, to start, um, we need to start figuring out new, perpetual, leave it to your grandchildren, time horizons and decades, sorts of structures for risk capital. And also, I mean, we just, we, it, it, there's not enough experimentation. So I'm, I'm really committed over the next three, five years, I think it's sort of I where you're coming are, from, yeah. in, in helping people to prototype and, uh, and find beautiful little, <laughs> That, like let's fail and succeed forward quickly right. and find those pools <laughs> before right. we could exactly. not try to like create some whole the whole market system and it'll be this massive right. transactional everybody will you know create a secondary market. I mean that'll happen, but that's going to take a, right. a while. Not to take anything away from anybody who's working on that, but it's just such an important point. And and um, you know every single one of us who's been at this for a little or a long while knows that. We, once we figure out those structures, that we've ex once we experiment with them, we also have to share our experimentation so that people understand exactly what we tried and whether it worked and whether it didn't. And that sharing part of it, going back to the sharing economy, we also have to be the sharing, the sharing knowledge, you know, is very important. Um, um, and so that's another element that I think about uh, all the time. 
I'm going to share a couple of personal experiences that either you told me or that I had myself at SOCAP, and then where we're going to go um, before we get to Q&A is I'm going to ask you if there's something that you experienced here, and Wayne, since I know you were traveling, something that you experienced in this, basically the last couple of weeks that actually radically shifted the way you're thinking about um, what you're going to work on for the next three to five years. So you've been here. You've been experiencing a lot of, uh, of the knowledge sharing and discussions here. A couple that, that really hit me, uh, one was, and Lindsay's sitting right here, and I heard this through uh, Liz, Lindsay, but this idea that we need to learn how to bring new sectors in. Um, Lindsay's been responsible for our oceans um, content and, and track here, and you know, it's a place where we're still looking for more entrepreneurship, but we're also really trying to figure out how to bring that sector into this, sort of this movement, and so learning how to bring new sectors in is something that I uh, observed and thought about and experienced a lot this week. And the other one, which is, uh, was told to me by another one of our content um, leaders for the week, was a description of a panel, which some of you might have been in. It was a relatively small discussion, but it sounds like it was very animated. There were 25 or 30 people in the room, and the panel were a group of, of doctors. And, the, and in starting off the conversation with the, the room, the doctors, who of course as doctors are used to presenting at medical conferences about medical um, issues, did what people usually do if you're good at panelists, with panels, which is you say, you know, who's in the room with me? How many doctors are here with us? And only one raised his or her hand, and the doctors all looked at one another. And then apparently what happened next, I'm probably describing this a little loosely because it's secondhand to me, then, then the, the person moderating the panel said, okay, so how many healthcare providers are there in the room? And nobody raised their hand. So now the doctors on, on stage are getting a little confused and mystified. And so then finally the one who was moderating said, who is in this room? And he basically <laughs> went around and asked every single person to tell him who, who they were. And the fantastic thing about that story was that of course they were investors, um, community development people, um, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, they were people that, 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 that the medical profession never talks to. And, and that was a really kind of a significant story as told to me. So for you guys, um, from something that's happened to you from Monday, if you'd been sitting here Monday with me, you might have been answering my questions one way. Now it's Friday. Um, uh, is, has anything that you've experienced during SOCAP given you a big, like, ah, you know, clip to the jaw or changed radically or even a little bit the way you're thinking about the next three to five years? Mm -hmm. Start with you. Sure. Well, I, I would kind of dovetail with your story. Um, I, I will admit that one of my big fears as this community started coming together was that it would be another kind of isolated club, you know, doing cool things kind of within itself. And um, two of my greatest mentors, Hazel Henderson and Susan Davis, always <laughs> say, you know, the best way to grow a movement is throw a better party. And uh, yeah. Tuesday, <laughs> I, I was here. And I was meeting with a group of folks focused on investing in women, so a group very near and dear to my heart. And in one door walks three of my friends from the biomimicry community. So we've got like the science and the entrepreneurs kind of combined in that group. And then in another door walk two of my friends from really big, giant, old, old school kind of investment firms. And so we've got that whole like big corporate finance kind of side covered. And then finally in, and this is a multi, door room, I guess, in the, in the last door, <laughs> and it really was, in the last door uh, come some friends from a conscious investing, very spirit-centric uh, community that I'm part of, and we were all there in the same room, and I thought, this, this is a good this party. Rocks. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm thrilled. <laughs> Love that. Who wants to go next? Finit? I'll go last. You'll go last. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I can go next. Um, Tuesday morning, Nest held a breakfast, and they are releasing the findings of a report of what the col collaborative economy, the peer economy, sharing economy looks like in the developing world um, for the bottom of the pyramid, right? So for the four billion people making less than $5 a day. And the needs are very different. It's, it's very strong communities looking for you know, how do, how, do, how do we get different sorts of goods and um, different sort of, you know, um, collaborations are coming out. And it was very inspiring to think about, you know, globally uh, where this is going. Um, two startups I thought were interesting. One is a group of entrepreneurs who are working with favelas in Brazil to put them on Airbnb as 
families, you know, clean out a room and bring in someone who wants to have a very different sort of experience staying mm -hmm. in Brazil, um, or Ride.o uh, in Brazil that's helping people uh, do ride sharing on not smartphones, yeah. <laughs> on dumb phones or whatever they're called, <laughs> um, which I think is also very yeah. inspiring and interesting. So I, I think that that is exactly the kind of thing peers will tell the story of. It's great. Uh, just that there's, I was thinking that there is such a thing as going to too many cocktail parties. I, I think it's, <laughs> but I, I was okay. I learned my lesson on Tuesday night, and, and yeah, last night I was, uh, or whatever. I, it worked out okay. Um, I think I would, I would just sort of cap on it. this. This, this year here um, solidified something that I, I mean I think has been bubbling under the surface for me, and also in the conversation around. Um, around two things. One is this, inc this inclusive sort of multi-dimensional di diversity is value. Um, and it's, it certainly is in nature, right? Um, and you know, when you've got like, I'm sitting there with Herman Miller and this great influx of old friends from the social, social investment financial advisor market, who I don't think have been here mostly, are here. And then you've got, you know, you've got Packard with Oceans yeah. and you know, these major foundations and um, Domini and Pax World. And Joe Keith's walking around, the CEO of Pax World, one of my favorite. And, and you've got Steve Fauci, who worked with Calvert, and a bunch of Calvert people were here too. The, you know, it's like, in addition to everything that it's always been, yeah. which are just you know amazing top shelf entrepreneurs and impact investors and more and more wealth, yeah. people of wealth, all of that coming together, I think that it gets to this. Look, this is not a sector. This is a point of view. Right. This is a values-based lens that right. you apply to everything. Right. So to be kind of in segments and categories and pillars and silos, as Jed Emerson you know says is really counterproductive, and right. yet we have to do, we have to limit scope, otherwise it gets so mind-blowing right. that you can't get anything accomplished, and I'm afraid this is a festival, this is a celebration, mm -hmm. and uh, I think people who come for this sort of vertical like, intensity are probably a little bit yeah. perplexed, but you know, it's a Lollapalooza, yeah. and, I, and I think, but I think applying that to, it's just you don't get in these little boxes, like, yeah. okay, I don't, I'm not noticing what I'm doing with my consumption or my investing, but I care about what I do with my work or my philanthropy, I mean, no, it's all, this is it, and the millennials get it, which I'm so psyched about, so I'm not worried, you know, 20 years plus, I'm just sort of wondering how it goes, yeah. how the path goes. How the path that was, goes. Um, so that, and that, that, was, that was the other thing, and the other thing I, I really caught a few times in a few panels, so a theme, and I'll just add to that, the risk of going on too long, is, um, is I feel like there's a new piece of tech coming up, which is this kind of, and we played around with this at the hub a little bit, but people have alluded to anecdotes around this, of finding ways to communally hack ourselves. Right. Um, in a really, not like intentional, weird, like let's get pizza and pajamas for a weekend thing, although we, you can do that too, you know, where you get a whole bunch of people, but where you bring diverse points of view and skills and resources together around problems, uh, whether it be people or planet or fund structure or entrepreneurs, I think we're gonna get a lot better and I'm starting to feel like that's something that's I'm seeing more realizable, realizable yeah. here, not here, but in the communities here. Yeah. That's it, I, I think that's a really great sort of design toolkit thing, right. um, and then putting stuff on the track, you know, incubating, accelerating, bringing it back. Um, uh, and we did this that great thing with Creative Currency right. with Amex in the city of San, uh, San Francisco for like six months, where we tried to you know do do some of that stuff right. last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never mind. I don't. I'm, you can see. I just like that's that's five minutes right there. So but, I'll shut up. But I know. But but everyone's you know so appreciates the, the 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 idea that we're actually getting to the place where we can have this diversity and we can hack ourselves. But but not just randomly, uh, not in hackathon style, but really take these problems on and use this amazing uh, diversity of of community to be able to solve them in place. I mean, that's a fantastic image. Um, Wayne, I know you weren't here all week, but I know you've been doing interesting things all week. So, <laughs> did any did something happen that, uh, during the course of the last several days that gave you a big aha? Um, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vinny. No. <laughs> but this this morning, uh, I had to be at a board meeting in Nebraska. So, um, but the 20, 27, 28 years ago. Uh, Myself and this other fellow, we started this social venture network, and the very first meeting, uh, you know, we didn't know what, what was going to And my assistant at the time said, Why? How, come, how come these people all have bright eyes? It wasn't because we were stoned, or at least 
most of us weren't, but it was kind of this sense of like this energy extending out and you knew you were like at the right time and the right place in the universe asking the right questions. And here we have people who are gatekeepers for the dreams of our society, both in terms of the resources, in terms of the money, the possibilities, the commitment. I mean, uh, it just makes you have goosebumps about what's going on here and this whole thing about throwing a better party, but also kind of making it not because we were ever cool kids, but becomes a cool kids club, which starts this reverberation through our, our society because of the quality of the interaction. You can just feel it here, and I wasn't here four days, but I was, you can just feel like, why are people shining a light inside? Right. Thank you. Benit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked uh, to be the last. Uh, I was trying to think pretty hard. So what is it I gained? Partly because I didn't realize till you asked that question. So, so, uh, so I was born, brought up, lived in India all my life. The first time I left India to fly out was to Singapore in 2001. I came to this country first time in 2005. And it was my first year to visit Europe as well. So. So not a guy who's, who's extensively traveled. Post-2005, of course, I have traveled every month, so <laughs> it's a different game. Uh, my context of travel always outside of India, India was to get something back. So I'll always go largely for begging for money because I wanted to, I was an investor, so I'm a professional beggar that way. <laughs> uh, so every time I sit in a flight, I'll have actually a clear idea of what I'll bring back. And, uh, this was one of those rare flights coming here, which I was not sure what I'm going to seek for. Mm. And uh, last four days, it was quite uncomfortable because I did not know what am I seeking, what am I asking. Uh, so what has happened in the last three, four days is uh, I realized there is a lot of people on the other side also seeking, and that I possibly had an opportunity to give back as well, mm -hmm. wherever I am. And, uh, so what has changed, and it's pretty dramatic change, so that's why I took so much time to think through, <laughs> is the equilibrium of give and take is basically what I discovered during the last four days, partly because I had no agenda coming right. here. Uh, it started with the, my discussion with Kevin about uh, should we rise above ourselves to collaborate rather than compete. Uh, and then over a period of time, uh, it seems like uh, the professional begging that I used to do, there, there is enough on both sides of the border. <laughs> somebody is seeking material, somebody is seeking some other part of your soul. So it's not one-way traffic, and that there is far more that you can give than what you think you're digging away, so that's it. I think I'm glad we had you go last. Yeah. That was, thank you very much. Right. Um, so we have, um, I wanna, add, I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna have you all do. <laughs> I'm going to have you all do one more thing for me, and then um, I want to make sure we get some questions from the audience. So I, I'm going to choose uh, two words, um, democratization and replication. Just bear with me. Um, and I want each of you in the shortest possible sentence to tell me what must happen in terms of either democratization or replication for us to get closer to that tipping point particularly if you can attach it to the next three to five year time frame. I know that we're all thinking out in 20 and 30 year and 50 year and 100 year cycles, but just that's the frame that I'm, I'm offering you. Um, and I uh, thank you for letting me be a little bit provocative, but I know you can all um, definitely handle this. So either with the, the word democratization or the word replication, pick the word for me and then tell me what must happen in order to get closer to the tipping point, particularly using the three to five year time frame. And when you're ready, let me know. I'll go. Okay, which word? I can go for both, but okay, let, maybe pick one. democratization. Democratization, okay. So I think uh, democratization of the right to own wealth. I think uh, we have a pretty serious challenge of concentrated wealth uh, across the world, both in developing and developed economies. Uh, and uh, I personally have worked in that because we have invested in companies that hold 10,000 people, 20,000 people actually hold shares. Uh, creating ownership is possibly one of the strongest ways, or democratizing the whole idea of wealth uh, is possibly one of the best ways of redistributing the centers of power as well. So, 
the second part is replication, and I think replication is replication of the goodness of the heart, possibly. So there are a few good people. If we can replicate that and make six billion good people, again, our problems will get solved far more easily. We won't need to do SOCAP or Sankal. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, Thank you. Do not follow Vinit's example. Pick one word, not two. <laughs> <laughs> and let me know which one you're picking. I'll, I'll do quick on demonstration. Um, OK. I mean, um, democratization. That was not a I'm going to do demonstration. I don't care what <laughs> you're trying to get me to do. I don't even know what I'm thinking about. No, replication, sorry. Replication. replication uh, and the word that, that I want to pair with it is, um, is distributed. Uh, and I mean that. In, in, a, in, a, in a power structure way, I mean it in a, in a, um, in, in a cultural translation, yep. indigenous translation. I think that we can create radical, you know, scaled change um, across the world, but we have to be willing to bottom up it with rules and the hub, you know, the hub network really right. follows this, this principle. This sub sub subsidiary is not a word I really like, subsidiarism right. or something, I, like words, quite, I understand yeah. it, but, but you know, this really letting the replication, the power, the agency, the stakeholder system be distributed through it so that it cannot be bottlenecked or perverted. Right. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, my word would be uh, accessibility. Uh, and the reason I say that is... <laughs> That's not one of the words, man. You have to pick replication I, I, or democratization, but no, it's okay. I, I, I learned this in... I, 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 I know this is going to happen at some point. But the real question is about accessibility. Let me say... <laughs> Please. <laughs> and what I mean by that is the communication of what we are doing here. And who doesn't want to be part of this? I mean, if properly communicated. I mean, you, that's why I feel like there is this tipping point that we're getting close to. If we can make it accessible to our, our, our brothers and sisters. Great. One of the things when I think about the democratization or the distribution of what I think is really exciting about the sharing economy um, is the fact there's a whole new class of entrepreneurs. Some are saying micro entrepreneurs, but there's a way in which you can make a living or save money um, in entirely new ways. Um, I think of a woman who was like a big hiker in San Francisco um, named Sarah and now makes her living leading tours through San Francisco like urban hikes. She's a peer tour guide right, great. and there's peer travel happening all over you know, the globe. It's just one example of sort of a, an industry that is being inverted right. and democratized. Democratized. Absolutely. Cool. Yes. Well, I, I'm going to stay on script. Uh, I, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you picked uh, replication because nature does not scale. Nature replicates, and it always integrates development and growth together. You never have one without the other. And one really, this is a geeky answer, but it's really vital, I think. One important element in that all functioning is to have effective feedback loops. And there are three pieces to that. One is that the appropriate feedback has to be sent out. So be careful, right, what you're measuring, what you're asking for, what you're monitoring. But then the other two pieces, I'm not sure we're that focused on yet as a community. There has to be a receptor for that feedback that is attuned to it and able to take it in right. in an effective and appropriate way. So you can do all the fancy metrics reports you want if they are not heard and incorporate it, it doesn't do any good. And then the third piece is that that receptor has to trigger not just response, but appropriate response. And that is how, right. when you replicate, you get better and better and better, as opposed to just right. same, same, same. And so I'm really excited said. to see that take root. So we have um, time for a couple of questions from the audience, and I think Bjorn's ready to like run, run out with microphones. Is that right? Um, and we literally have time for perhaps two or three questions, if you have them. We'd love to take them. There's one. Forget the whiteboard. And the whiteboard. I won't forget. If we can also, well, at the end of this, we're going to put this map up. And I think that's also up to Bjorn, so he has to multitask here. <laughs> Please, go ahead with your question. Great. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so my question is, uh, uh, coming off of the question that was asked in the early segment on engaging 20-somethings and under. Yeah. Um, and Wayne's point about accessibility. Um, what is the movement doing, what is the, the social impact movement doing to connect with what's happening in higher education, um, which seems to me a really vibrant place for the emergence of the new leadership of this movement? There are probably 25 people in the room who want to answer that question. Um, and who on stage wants to answer it? Higher education, where is 
the, this uh, movement. I had made an appeal to actually introduce the course on greed management. <laughs> <laughs> that might actually be a very good idea for the society mm. in higher education. So. It's a great example. Every, every undergrad university of, that's worth its salt in the next 10 years will have a social innovation entrepreneurship right. Center program, et cetera, uh, in the same way that every decent MBA program has been greened in the last 10, and it's not a prediction. It's and I'm time. looking forward to them starting to be more competitive with one another. I mean, really tasking themselves to get higher and higher quality so that, yeah. you know, we need, as they proliferate or they replicate, we need to see more sense of, of, of real, a real sense of the quality of, that, uh, of those programs. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would just add, I mean, the yes, next please. iteration beyond that, I think we're already starting to see where every entrepreneurship just is a social right. entrepreneurship you don't program. Pick. You're just starting to get to the point where you don't need a regular entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur. They're, they're starting to mesh in a way that is really encouraging to me. And one more question, one or two. Anybody got this? While we're waiting, and I'll just answer and say, Hunter Lovins this morning talked about teaching a course last night out of her Airbnb with a co-director who was teaching out of the hub, and they were doing, it was to their massive, their MOOC, right? Their massive right. online course. Uh, and so it's just a reminder of like, we're in such an era really where good point. education, poof, really democ good point. democratized. Yes, right here. Yeah, the financial domain is so dominant, and it's very much based on a mechanistic kind of metaphor and imagery and whatnot. Could you speak to how you maybe begin to make the transition to more nature-based, nature-responsive imagery and structures and whatnot in the financial domain? Yeah, so the thing that has been most, I, I'm assuming that. Please, me. no, okay. I think you're the right person to take uh, the, the, So you, you touched on exactly it. I, when I started in investing, I mean, I'm not 300 years old. It was 20 years ago. Um, investing was still a, a very uh, connected, integrated, multidisciplinary, liberal arts relationship oriented, mutual benefit kind of endeavor. And I think that core is actually still there. I think that core is intact. What has completely overshadowed that core and in some cases overtaken it is all the stuff we've added around it, all the processes and procedures and tools and mechanics and you know ever, ever more sophisticated products, but they're really just processing that same core. And so what most of my work is focused on is trying to recenter on that core. Um, and what gives me the most encouragement is that when I think of how I was taught to invest in one of the most conservative, you know, old school mainstream organizations that exist, it is almost completely aligned with everything that this community is, everything that we're talking about. Good investing is good investing. It's that, it's that mechanized, engineered set of elements, I think, yeah. that have taken us far away from that. And these natural principles, right. I think, help bring us back. Did any of you want to add anything to that one? Here we got a couple more questions. We're going to take one more, and then we're going to show our map, and then we're going to be out of time. And I don't know if there's a mic near you. Um, I don't want you to have to have a dance off to decide who answers the question. Do you mind? Do you mind if I give it to this gentleman? Okay, thank you. What I really like of the panel is, you know, like we need talking about giving from the heart, being kind, you know. Um, Tim talking about the impact assets. Kathleen talking. So the wonderful panel and the Wayne talking about spiritual component, I was thinking about a question about how do you do distributed problem solving in this world and what could be that major impact that distributed problem solving collectively can make such an impact which could be remembered for lives to come. Okay, so distributed problem solving. So this sort of goes back, Tim, to where you were uh, a few minutes ago and each of you has actually alluded to this, um, how you take a problem and solve it but also use a model that allows it to be distributed so it's not held closely. Anybody want to take that one on? One of the visions we've had in this democratization kind of thing is to call for salons and communities of uh, invest, just local community salons, to look at how you can use some monies and in the community to make, you know, like put solar panels on the schools or what else you can do. And then for those communities, to share with others things they've done and other problems they've come. I mean, it's like, I'd like to see the next generation of Kiwanis Club go in this kind of area right. to have these kinds of conversations about building our, our world. So that would be 
And I'm sorry to say that we're out of time. I wanted to thank Lily, who's our graphic artist over here. And I think at the end of this, <laughs> I think at the end of this, we'll have a map. <laughs> and last but not least, we want to thank you. So we'll give you a round of applause, audience. Um, the hearty audience here at the end. And thank you all very much. So thank you.